Facebook. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are just connecting our Zoom and Facebook feeds. So we'll get started in just a few moments. And we are all connected. Take it away, Nan. Good evening. I'm Nan Rohr. I'm the chair of the Baltimore Museum of Industries Board of Trustees, as well as a member of the Pratt Insiders. I am excited to welcome all of you to this evening's Writers Live program, a conversation between two local journalists, Amelia Pang and Alec McGillis. If you aren't familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, we are housed in a 19th century oyster cannery on the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We now even boast our own LED light display on our 1942 whirly crane, and I highly encourage you to check out those vibrant colors. At the BMI, we are dedicated to telling the stories of the workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. Programs like tonight's are made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you are currently a supporter, we thank you. And if you'd like to find out more about becoming a member, I encourage you to visit our website, thebmi.org. Your support will help ensure that we can continue to engage people in important conversations like the one we're about to have now. Tonight's program is an example of how two anchor institutions in Baltimore are working together to bring you incredible programs. We are delighted to partner with the Pratt on a series of public programs this spring, including a discussion on Women of Steel, part of our Bethlehem Steel Legacy Project on Tuesday, March 30th. Now I'd like to hand over the floor to Kelly Shimabukuro, Chief of Programs and Outreach at the Pratt. Thank you so much and enjoy the evening. Thank you so much, Nan, and a good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Shimabukuro, Chief of Programs and Outreach at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Thank you for joining us for Writers Live, Amelia Pang, in conversation with Alec McGillis. We're pleased to present tonight with the Baltimore Museum of Industry. I hope all of you will help spread the good news. Pratt is reopening its doors and limiting browsing and computer access starting Monday, March 8th. Our locations will be operating at 25% capacity and of course, the safety of everyone is a high priority. We are also looking forward to the Women of Steel panel presented with the BMI on March 30th. You'll hear from women who shattered the glass ceiling working at Bethlehem Steel's Sparrow Point Mill. Before introductions, some virtual logistics for tonight. If you're watching in Zoom, please click on the Q&A button on the, your screen to post questions. If you are watching on Facebook, please post in the comments. A survey will be posted near the end of the program. Your feedback helps us serve you. Today, we are thrilled to host Amelia Pang and Alec McGillis in conversation. It's going to be an important discussion about work, the role of government, ethical buying decisions, and more. If you can, please support locally by ordering your copy of Made in China and pre-ordering Fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One Click America from the Ivy Bookshop. Links will be posted in the chat. Amelia Pang is an award-winning journalist who has written for publications such as Mother Jones and The New Republic. She has covered topics ranging from organic import fraud to the prevalence of sexual violence on Native American reservations. In 2017, the Los Angeles Press Club awarded her first place in investigative journalism for her undercover reporting on the exploitation of smuggled immigrants who were recruited to work in Chinese restaurants. Amelia grew up in a Mandarin speaking household in Maryland and holds a BA in literary studies from the New School. She lives near Washington, DC with her husband and organic farmer. This is her first book. Alec McGillis is a senior reporter for ProPublica. McGillis previously reported for the New Republic, the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun. He won the 2016 Robin Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting, the 2017 Polk Award for National Reporting and the 2017 Elijah Paris Lovejoy Award. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, Atlantic, New York, Harper's, The New York Times Magazines, among other publications. A resident of Baltimore, McGillis is the author of The Cynic, 
a 2014 biography of Senator Mitch McConnell, and the forthcoming fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One Click America. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Amelia Pang and Alec McGillis. Thank you so much for the warm welcome and for having us tonight. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, and I have to say, this is the first that I heard of the Pratt reopening, and it makes me so happy to hear that. It's one of my, my favorite places in Baltimore, and I just missed it so, so much, especially since it, things shut down right after the great renovation. So I'm so eager to go back. Um, and I'm just really, really honored to be part of this discussion tonight. Um, I, uh, I just I found Amelia's book completely spellbinding and upsetting and, and, and infuriating. Um, and, and I just urge everyone to, to, to read it. Um, it the, book, the book does something that, that I look for in, in journalism and, and investigative nonfiction and, and that I sort of strive for in a lot of my work, which is to, to draw connections between things, to draw, draw connections between, between people who are suffering over here and the people who are responsible for it way over here, even if they're a very long way away or a completely different echelon of society, um, always kind of trying to draw those links of accountability and responsibility um, and, and just show how things are connected. And, and this book does that. Um, and I'm just very grateful for it. I, I, um, I'm, I'm abashed to say that even I, as someone who reads a lot and has looked into this whole world to some degree that I knew as little as I did about what's been going on um, in, these, in this forced labor realm in China. So I'm really grateful for it. Um, I thought I would just start off, Amelia, by reading your very riveting opening, um, a, a passage from your riveting opening section where you describe a, a mom in suburban Portland, Oregon in 2012, kind of panicking over what to do about Halloween for her, for her five-year-old daughter, trying to make things special for her. And at the last second, going to Kmart and buying some of those foam um, tombstones that you see in decorations um, around Halloween, with cheap foam, foam tombstones. She buys them, you know, daughter, daughter likes them. She's opening them up to, uh, to, to set them up and she finds in the tombstones a, a note um, and she uh, unfolds this paper and starts to read. And it says, this is what the note says. This product produced by Unit 8, Department 2, the Shenzhou labor camp, Shenyang, Laoning, China. People who work here have to work 15 hours a day without Saturday, Sunday break and any holidays. Otherwise they will suffer torturement, beat and rude remark, nearly no payment, People who work here suffer punishment one to three years averagely, but without court sentence, unlaw punishment. Many of them are Falun Gong practitioner who are two totally innocent people only because they have different belief to CCBG. They open suffer more punishment than others. So this mom reads this note and is completely, completely bewildered by it, doesn't even know if it's real. Um, but it is real, and um, and we learn from there who wrote this note and what lies behind it. So I, I guess for starters, who is the man who wrote this note? Uh, the author of that note was a man named Sun Yi. He was a political dissident. Uh, specifically, he did practice the banned uh, religion Falun Gong. Um, they <clears throat> were banned in the 90s, and since then they've taken on a lot of uh, activism in China in terms of advocating for pro-democracy and they do have kind of this unique ability to organize large protests and some pretty brazen and bold uh, acts of resistance against the Chinese government that the Chinese government frankly finds pretty pretty um, frightening to them uh, and and so he you know he, he was actually this really really um, sweet and quiet mannered man who he, he just he was kind of romantic he had this wife that he he loved so much and um really they went through a lot to be together um he when he went to college in the 80s he was when china was first opening up he was really intellectually curious he read hegel and it was just really curious about the world um and i really wanted to show all these human elements about him to show just 
this full dimensional human being that ended up in this labor camp uh, manufacturing our cheap goods. Why did you decide to take this on, you know, in a big way, in a, in a book length way? I mean, we're, as journalists, we're often, we're having to kind of pick our targets and pick our scale and how, how big to go on things. And um, there's been some coverage of the forced labor system in, in China, but not nearly enough. Um, what, what made you decide to take it on and, 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 and to focus it mostly around him? That's a great question. He, you know, his letter was not the first or, or the last letter of this kind right. to be found by an American consumer or a global consumer. Um, uh, the first one was actually arrived in the US in the 90s. Um, it was written by an activist named Chim Po Kong. He was a pro-democracy activist. And, um, and at the time, it was it, it, a lot of people expressed outrage. There were even a congressional hearing about it. Um, Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi released statements about it at the time. Yeah. It was this whole big deal. And then it just kind of faded. Um, and then more letters like these continued to come over the years and nothing, there were no meaningful changes in company sourcing practices or US legislation to actually fundamentally address this issue. So I, I wanted to explore some of the, some of the causes um, of, of this problem and, and how, how large it's becoming. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, there were a lot of stories to focus on, um, but I wanted to focus on his because it was, a, it was a Halloween decoration that he was manufacturing this labor camp. So it was mm -hmm. this incredibly um, chilling connection because yeah. he, it's these decorative gravestones that right. for a kid's party, but it was manufactured in a camp where there were literally um, unmarked graves where people are just getting thrown into these graves when they die and yeah. and that, that unfortunately this is a condition that's very similar to a lot of the camps in China and a lot of them are manufacturing goods for us and our kids and we I, I just I wanted to like I said show that connection right right why has it been so hard for our government you know at, despite have you know after having learned definitely learned quite a bit about what's been happening there and being aware of it for quite a while now. Why has it been so hard for, for, for our government to really, to, to clamp down on it, to discourage it, to, 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 hold, to hold China and also uh, corporations accountable for it? It seems like it should be, it should be doable. It's so, it's so extreme, so egregious um, that, that even in our kind of you know broken political system, that fixed that dealing with that should be should at least be manageable. Why why has that been so hard? I think one of the main um, things is is corporate. It, it, it infringes too much on corporate interests. If we really were to cramp down on this, um, for, there were some legislation passed, um, especially throughout the '90s, to to address this. Um, including a memorandum of agreement we established with China. And it was just never really enforced um, very well. <clears throat> and I think to some extent, a lot of politicians on both parties uh, knew that. Um, and that was why they were willing to, um, to, to maybe make certain public remarks or write certain legislations that aren't actually in fact enforced very well. Um, for example, um, the U.S. government is supposed to be allowed to visit and inspect uh, labor camps or camps where there's um, some there's suspicion that they are exporting the goods um, using prison labor. Um, but China really actually gives the U.S. permission to go, or sometimes they'll wait ten years before granting permission for such a request. Um, and by that time, of course, there's not much evidence that can be found ten years later. And just these kinds of things happen all the time, and and the U.S. doesn't really push back. Um, even during Trump's trade war, like human rights wasn't really brought up as a as a talking point in terms of trade negotiations. But this is very much about trade and and how our corporations are sourcing from places like China. Right. Um, I, I again, I really urge people to 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 buy the book to to, to be able to read firsthand just directly how how harrowing. Um, Sunni's experience in this one um, facility was, but 
but I, I imagine just as a kind of a dark wedding of appetite, I mean, would, you, would you maybe, it might be helpful for people to hear a little bit about some of what he went through um, in there. Because it's just, it's just, it's, it's beyond belief really to think that in our time, um, it, it just, it reads like something truly from, a, from another era, what he was enduring. Yes, uh, these camps were based off of Soviet gulags. So the torture there is pretty severe, not, not so unlike Soviet gulags. Um, and and, and the, the difference is that they, they very much still exist in China and they not, not only still exist, they're expanding rapidly. Um, so some of the torture that he went through included just being being hung on for long, long hours um, and <clears throat> sometimes multiple days at a time and um, not having access to food and uh, just, it is, I, I don't want to scare people too much, but it is, um, he, it was very gruesome, his experiences there and he didn't have access to medical care really. Um, and he, a lot of the detainees there were often starved and extremely um, malnourished and, um, and pretty brutally beaten if they didn't work fast enough to meet um, what was essentially our production deadlines for our companies. And, and for him, like part of the, one of the things that I found most wrenching was the, the sort of the emotional distress he went through because he all, all, the, all the while was worrying about his family, worrying about his, his wife who, who, who he knew was gonna be coming under, under duress on the outside. Um, and and we see we see the impact this has I mean, on 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 that. I mean, his marriage essentially is is broken by by this, along with his body, in a way. Yes, his marriage, his mind, his body were all broken by this. Um, it's, it's it was incredibly stressful for him because when he disappeared into this camp. He knew that nobody knew where he was or where he went or how to find him or how to get help for him. Um, a lot, the, a lot of these people, most of them are detained arbitrarily um, without being sentenced in a court and without access to lawyers. So it took a really long time before he could even find a way to get word out to his family where he was. <clears throat> yeah. um, and, and on top of that, it was just the loneliness of being in this camp and just working and all you spending all of your waking hours working. Um, he hadn't seen anyone from outside the campus so long that when he accidentally saw someone one day when he was walking by the window, um, it just excited him so much. And it reminded him that he was still alive. Right. Because it really, he really felt like he was kind of, it felt like he had kind of died and was already in hell. Yeah, that was such a powerful, powerful scene that his glimpse of the person, you know, riding by or walking by. Um, the one of the things I loved about the book is is that you draw draw the connections around the globe, and the connections are not just to the governments and corporations that have allowed this, um, but in, in the case of the corporations, actually, kind of you know invited it and, and encouraged it. Um, but you do draw the connection also to the West, to the consumer, to the individual consumer in the U.S., the person who's buying those Halloween, Halloween de decorations or the clothes or the cheap electronics or whatever it might be. And, and, and in a sense, you know, holding us accountable too. Um, I'll just I'm gonna read a, just a one quick line here. Um, As conscientious consumers, we can take things into our own hands. After all, we are foreign trade. Our purchasing choices are the source of demand, and our boycotts serve as accountability. Um, I've I've noticed in my own reporting, you know, writing this book that's coming out that's partly about Amazon, that people bristle often when you when you bring up their own buying decisions, their own consumers' decisions, decisions as consumers, and and often just sort of say, you know, what do you expect me to do? There's you know, we're all we're all looking for the cheapest deal. We're all looking for the quickest, most convenient deal. Um, Though the these issues really should lie with th these are systemic, structural issues that are that have to be addressed by legislation, by by sort of the, the broader economy. This is not up to me, the consumer. Um, why 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 do you take issue with that, and why is that not 
a sufficient way for us to think about this problem? I think consumers are definitely not powerless. Um, maybe an individual, one person stopping, making a decision to stop shopping from Amazon or Kmart isn't going to do much. But if that person turns into 5,000 people and then 50,000 people uh, who not only threaten to stop shopping from one of these companies, but also make them known that, hey, you know, we are your target market and we are, we have a huge issue with the way that you source from these factories. And if, if, if you, if you could just be a, a more transparent about your relationship with these factories and how you're sourcing from them um, and who you're sourcing from, uh, then we would consider maybe buying from you again. You know, it's not necessarily a permanent, permanently avoiding a particular, a particular brand like these, right. there's things that we can do as consumers to push companies to be more transparent and more sustainable. Um, but right now companies, a lot of companies haven't seen any evidence that making this shift to sustainability will actually be profitable for them. Right. Um, you, you, you very helpfully listed at, in the conclusion of the book, a whole bunch of things that consumers can specifically do in, in, in demand of companies. Um, are there some among those that you found that you think are most important or most worth focusing on? I think one simple thing that we could ask, we could start asking companies to do is to um, just rewrite their contract at, without much extra cost to them. Just rewrite the contract uh, with their factory uh, to allow them to visit the factories um, with, um, with, without announcing their visits mm -hmm. and saying something, I have a line in there about them potentially sending people to sit outside the factories and follow the trucks that leave them to see exactly which relationships, which factories they have relationships with, which subcontractors they have relationships with, whether they're good quality factories um, that are actually paying workers um, and do have good conditions, or are they subcontracting to prison camps? Because it was quite easy to see some of them. When I went to China to follow these trucks, it was quite easy to see the connection there. It's not hidden very well. Um, you follow a truck and then it goes to your prison camp where there's, um, where you, you talk to the guards there and they admit that the prisoners inside are um, doing manufacturing work and they can export to you. And, you know, the, the, the name of the prison is just listed, written right out there. You know, it's the, the connections is not really hard to find if a company really were to look or to really show the factory that they're serious about finding this out and that they could look. Um, like just this kind of a messaging in the contract could really, really, um, just show the factory that they're serious about this in a way that factories, it's a message that the factories haven't been getting. Right. What was it like when you made those connections? I mean, literally like watch the truck going from here to there. It must have been both, both kind of just, just depressing to actually see it happening, but then also um, somehow rewarding from a reporting standpoint um, just to see to see, oh my gosh, like there it is, um, sort of an aha moment. What was the, what was that when you when you had those those those, those occasions? I was um, just overwhelmed because the, you follow a truck and sometimes they drive two hours to go to go to another factory in another right. area. Um, and then you come back to that camp and then it, it just right away you see another truck and you, you're on it again. And they were just so, so active. They were working with so many different types of factories. I was surprised that they weren't necessarily just making one type of product. They were working with the pharmaceutical, they were working with an official Apple supplier, they were working with um, a bike a bike factory, they were working with a pet products factory. Yeah. For some of them, maybe they were just doing the packaging or just one part of the assembly. Um, but really these camps could work with anyone. And I don't really, I can't say for sure there's a particular brand that's definitely safe from forced labor. Right, right. Um, on the on the consumer aspect of it, and one other part that I found fascinating was that you actually get into the kind of the brain science of why it is so difficult for us as consumers 
to to make ethical decisions and keep to keep the um, the dark side of the product in mind when we're deciding trying to decide whether to buy it. That there's something in our brain about seeing the cheap price that just overwhelms ethical thinking. And if you just talk a bit about that, because I found it t- totally fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, we we do feel immense joy when we see a really cheap price, especially if we feel like we're getting a, a bargain. Um, and 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 the way that our, our brains process information, it's it's really hard for human beings um, to to process many complicated things at once. Um, you right. should, like if you're considering the price versus do you like it or not versus do you like all these different factors um, to consider um, the ethical conditions of the factory that made it is is just too hard to think about at once. So so you have to compartmentalize, right. um, and and that you know has a comes from evolution wise. I mean that there's a reason for that. I mean we we have to be able to focus. We can't just think get, get distracted all the time by everything in order to survive. Um, so so that's that's kind of just how our brains work. Um, but with that said, uh, human beings are ethical and. Uh, in our essential nature, I think. And we do, we don't really want to buy something that we know this specific product was manufactured in a really terrible way, or it's associated with something awful. There's actually been studies on on how consumers um, process this information and how long the information stays in their brain. And and in this one particular study, it focused on um, n- knowing that a product was counterfeit, um, and, and um, having the consumer read something really awful about that particular product. Um, despite the cheapness of the price, the vast majority of consumers studied chose not to buy it um, if, they, if they read something terrible about it just before yeah. um, making that decision. But the downside is that impact only lasts um, maybe a half an hour. Um, if they were to consider buying it a half an hour later, they would. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be quite at the forefront of their of their minds, um, so it just comes to show the importance of of knowing the information in the first place and being open to reading and and being open to, to discussing it and thinking about it. That's it's a depressing commentary on us that we can't even hold that information <laughs> for more than half an hour as as a as sort of a persuasive fact. It's just that thirty minutes alone is enough to kind of erase it from from our kind of ethical framework or, or yeah. Yeah. well to be fair that study was was only on on counterfeit products the ethics of buying counterfeits um which yeah. i think the the human cost is not quite as um obvious right to knowing that oh this was manufacturing labor camp where people were tortured where women were sexually abused where terrible terrible thing where people die um every day um just i think the since the, the, the horror of, of those details is so much um, and higher, I think maybe hopefully our, our threshold for this kind of information will also yeah. will be higher. Um, the, the book, you know, is, is focuses pr- primarily on Sunni, but then, then um, he unfortunately, you know, suffers untimely death um, after he does manage to, to escape China. Um, and the focus turns to what's been happening more recently with forced labor in China, which is now um, where the story, as it were, has moved primarily to um, to Xinjiang with the the Uyghurs and um, and everything that that's that they're going through. Um, if you you know, again, this is something that has been report, reported on somewhat here, but not enough, and and it's just great that the book goes into it more expansively. Um, but if if you could just, you know, t- tell us a little bit about what's what's been happening there and and how you how you decided to bring that part of the story in, which is really in a way the most, you know, the 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 current f- form of this of this um, nightmare. Yes, I think the camps have actually worsened with the rise of the of the Uyghur camps. Mm-hmm. They're now associated with the genocide of one particular ethnic group, mm-hmm. right? Um, and between 2015 and 2018, just in those years alone, um, China's 
policies towards Uyghurs, including um, forced sterilization and forced abortions, and just and a lot of that does happen in these kinds of camps. Um, these things contributed to an 84% decrease in the population, uh, in the sizes, in the birth, and well, in, in actually, in, I'm sorry, decrease in the birth rates of two of the largest uh, Uyghur prefectures in China, mm -hmm. um, and that's just, that's just such a significant decrease um, in such a short amount of time, and that does qualify as one of the UN's one one of the UN's five definitions for genocide, mm -hmm. suppression of birth, uh, and so how is this suppression of birth happening? It's happening a lot of times in these types of camps um, where they are being tortured and manufacturing all kinds of goods for us. Um, everything from PPE equipment to human hair extensions to the raw materials for solar panels uh, and, and baby pajamas. There's just so much that comes out of Xinjiang. Yeah. Um, the I wonder what it was like as I was reading, you know, or sort of how you, you're very open in the book about your, um, your family connections to Falun Gong, your, your mom, um, and, and then you also have, um, have, have Uyghur heritage. And I wondered what it was like for you um, reporting on this, writing about it when, you know, given that, that this is, it's personal, right? And and um, I'm a big believer, by the way, in writing about things that are personal. And um, um, so it's, uh, but there's always the question of sort of how one goes about it. And 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 how how did you how did that sort of infuse everything? The fact that 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 this was this is this is this is actually on two different fronts, kind of your family. Yeah, yeah I, I grew up with a lot of Falun Gong followers. Um, I mean, I'd agree with all their views, but they are, they're not bad people and they don't mm -hmm. definitely don't deserve to be um, imprisoned in that kind of way. And they, they, they're they really, really incredibly brave to be willing to um, take on the activism work that they do in China. Like I've known um, some of my mom's friends who, is, did that kind of work in China and managed to escape, and um, and, and they a lot of them do have friends and families that didn't make it get perished in one of these camps. Mm -hmm. um, and we are also a part we are part Chinese and part Uyghur. Mm -hmm. uh, my my grandmother was from Yurimchi, Xinjiang. Um, yeah. She was in you know at the time she knew the language and she knew the culture, um, but within kind of just one generation, due to a number of reasons. Uh, that culture and identity was lost. Like now, my everyone I know in my family, or the at least the family that we're in touch with, uh, are pretty much just only identify as Han Chinese and grew up in Han majority areas. And even though some of them may look a lot more Uyghur than than we do Chinese, um, mm -hmm. everyone just only knows how to speak Chinese and only identifies as Chinese. And you know that that um, yeah, what started off as more of a cultural genocide that we experience has. Um, unfortunately, unfolded into actual genocide. Right. Um, I, I saw that someone um, uh, in the has brought up a good question about another sort of uh, contemporary aspect of this, which is the fact that the, um, the that a lot of the forced labor is now being disguised as as substance abuse treatment. Right. That that that, that there's sort of a blurring between between those two, between those realms. And um, how is, you know, how is that developed and how, how, how has that kind of changed the picture of, 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 of forced labor over there? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, um, that's, <coughs> that's, I think a really great question. Um, yeah, the, the camp that I focus on in the book is called Ma Sinjia Reeducation Through Labor Camp. Reeducation re Through Labor Camp is one type of labor camp in China. Um, since getting a lot of criticism for the West for having these camps and some actually domestic criticism as well, um, uh, China claimed they closed um, reeducation through labor camps, um, but they were only just one kind of camp and they actually didn't close. Um, a lot of them were re human rights watch found that most of them have reopened as uh, drug detox centers. 
um, but the people detained in there are not getting any kind of um, mental health or drug or addiction treatment. And uh, so some of the people detained in there aren't even actually drug addicts, they're just, they're just dissidents as well. And um, I actually visited um, some of these drug detox centers and other types of labor camps with different names. Um, and if you go there and you talk to the uh, guards and employees who are working there, um, they'll openly call this place a prison. They, they won't call it a drug detox center. They don't even think of it as a drug detox center. And I, I asked them, like, is this a drug detox center or a prison? And they said, and they had to pause and think about it before saying, oh, it's a drug detox center. Um, so it just comes to show that these camps have, even when China says they closed them or that they not aren't what they actually are, uh, if you actually go and visit the camps or if they let you visit, it, it's they're not they're very much not closed and and expanding and um, they they are definitely exporting all, all most of the goods that they're making. Right. Um, this reminds me of another good point that your the book makes or the book makes sure to address the, the point that's been raised by some defenders of the camps or people or down players of the camps who say, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're one to talk America. We all know that you have, that your prisoners um, do, you know, very, very low paid work in, in prisons in the US as well. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we have our own prison industries and, and, and all the rest, uh, making furniture or what have you. Um, why, why is that in fact different in, in, in terms of scale and, and, and kind? Yeah, um, I think it can sound like a valid argument because it's true America does have a huge prison problem um, and, and, and huge prison industries. Um, but Shane Bauer actually wrote a really good book yeah. called American Prison. Um, and it talks about how maybe at one point it operated in a way that's pretty similar to labor camps, but um, ever since the war on drugs, there's just been, there's too many prisoners that they, they can't all have jobs. Most of them aren't actually working anymore. Yeah. So, so a lot of prisoners right now are not actually working. And it, whereas in China, you do, pretty much everyone is doing some kind of manufacturing work. Right. Um, so the, we have some good questions. I'm going to turn to now um, from our viewers. Um, one, uh, Mary asks, um, how are you able to get such intimate details about sons imprisonments? Um, and that's something I thought about too as I was reading it because it's such incredible detail. I, I just really wanted to humanize him. When I was interviewing him, I would ask him over and over again for just sensory details. Mm -hmm. I like to do that in my reporting. It's often annoying for people like Sun and other people I interview because they're like, right. this is not that important. I'm here to talk about the torture and like the more important things. And I was like, oh, but what was, what was this? Did you smell anything? Was mm -hmm. there any smells? <laughs> um, what was the, do you remember the color? Do you remember any textures? What was going on mm -hmm. through your mind? What were the sounds? I just asked him, I just asked a lot of questions about sensory details. Right. Um, and I asked over and over again to really, to encourage him to remember more um, mm -hmm. and go back and, and, and it's kind of annoying for the interviewee, but, but, but I think it is important to really get these details to bring the, the story out alive. Right. And, the, and you were not, this was all happening. Um, you were, unfortunately, he, 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 he died before you could meet him in person, correct? And since yeah. this is all happening um, by phone? Uh, by Skype, yes. By and Skype, yeah. Later on, I, I did get yeah. some video footage of things right. that he filmed when he was in China. Yeah, um, it's a, no, it's incredible. I mean, that you, how much you, you were able to 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 recreate and conjure with those details was it was so so well done, really. Um, I, I was I was I was reading that with great with great admiration. Um, Cassandra asks um, very good question about you know the consumer. Uh, how can we turn around the conscience of our country? In the 60s, we boycotted California grapes. In the 80s or 90s, we boycotted mutual funds who included companies from South Africa. Now social media has enabled organization of groups who think certain populations are dispensable. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. I mean, here we are in a time where we, in theory, have more, more ability to, to kind of rally, technical ability to rally around you know, causes like this. Um, but it, it does seem in some sense that, that some element of, of conscience, of an activated conscience that was present just a few decades ago on these various fronts just 
isn't as as live anymore. And and I wonder, what, yeah, why is that? Do we think? I think maybe information overload. There's yeah. we just know we just hear so much about so many different really disturbing social problems all over the world. Um, it's it's hard to dedicate all our resources to, tar to target one specific problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I think there is hope that consumers consumer led movements can be really effective again, um, and and in some cases where they have been. Right. Um, for example, in the '90s, uh, there was a lot of protests against Nike um, mm -hmm. when we when it first became widely known that they were using sweatshops and what the conditions were like there, and and a lot of them, a lot of the protests were taking place on college campuses. These are kind of Nike's target market for right. young people that are hip, um, and you know maybe it didn't hurt Nike's bottom line or any company like that, but but it, it scared them enough that they started doing audits of their factories and they started publishing some information about their audits. And that is kind of a level of transparency that we hadn't seen before. Um, it was quite unprecedented. And, and although maybe it wasn't, it didn't go far enough, it, it was still a meaningful step in the right direction. We just need to kind of pick up that momentum again and push companies to go further to reveal Okay, but what exactly are you looking for in your audit? Can you release a full report? Can you release um, information about what prices you're offering the factory? I mean, can that factory realistically make those products for that price? Or do they have to subcontract work to some really shady places like labor camps? Mm -hmm. um, and how much time do you actually give the factories uh, to make the products? Um, are you constantly changing production deadlines to make it shorter and shorter and to Kind of take advantage of the latest fast fashion trends or are you realistically giving factories enough time to make it and if during my reporting i found that a lot of times the factories just don't have enough time to make it that the fines they receive is so high it's really debilitating for their business they, they have to find a way to get the job done whether it means um just subcontracting work to prisoners or somewhere else where the conditions are really awful so yeah. that does have a connection. Those are factors that our companies can control. And those are factors that we as consumers can control too. Mm -hmm. I do wonder sometimes if, if it's gotten, if the, that the consumer, consumer ethic has been weakened even more by the fact that even more of the purchases are now being made online, um, which of course comes around a little bit to, to my fulfillment, my, my, my new book, just the fact that as things get even more seamless and you're not even having to, um, you know, to, you're not even in the store, in the, in the actual store holding this product and kind of looking at the label and thinking about it, at least fleetingly, there's not, um, there's not even that kind of, kind of material interaction with what your decision you're about to make. Um, it's really just so, it's just that click. And, and it, and and it's just gonna be there in a few days, and and I and I do wonder if that 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 somehow you know makes makes even harder this challenge of getting people to draw the connections. I think you're absolutely right. I think there must be a connection there. It is. Um, yeah, I, I even find myself buying things that I don't necessarily need sometimes because it was just so easy. I didn't have time to think think it through. Um, right. So I even thinking, even just like creating a culture change where we just take a day to think about whether we actually want this or need this um, before we actually click to buy um, could be really helpful uh, down the line. Right, right. Um, uh, Tracy with the library notes that that the the audits are such a key part of all this. That this, the, these audits are happening, and and but. Well, but we need to see them, and and get, and actually getting them out is so is so crucial. And, and you talk about this in your rec list of recommendations. What what is the best way you think for us to get those audits released and and enforce force transparency on that front? I think the next time you go shopping at your favorite company store, I mean it's harder with Amazon with everything's just all on Amazon. Mm -hmm. But if you're actually buying something from a company's website, just take a moment and look at their sustainability page or their corporate social responsibility page. 
most companies have to have either one of two, one or both of them. And, and just, just see exactly what they say. Do they reveal any information about how they're doing audits? Mm -hmm. um, do they reveal the audits? I mean, some reveal more information than others, but most of them just don't really reveal enough information for you to be certain that they're not engaging in certain business practices that really, really encourage factories to use forced labor or sometimes leave factories with no choice but to use forced labor. So that starts with um, us pushing our companies to reveal certain key information that I go into more detail in the book. But And you can start doing that by shaming them on, on Twitter, on Facebook, on anywhere on social media, anything that's public and could potentially go viral. Just, just point out that, hey, your, real, your sustainability page is really, really vague. I don't believe that you are sustainable and that I don't believe, I think it's really um, um, terrible that you're using the word sustainability or ethic or ethical con ethical consumerism, ethical consumption as, 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 a, as a marketing buzzword essentially to make money. Um, show me how you're actually, what are you actually doing to be sustainable? Right. Yeah, it's, it's one thing that's so maddening is that things that this has all gotten worse in a way, even as there's way more rhetoric now around sustainability and around good practices. And, and it's just, it all just, it seems so cynical in a sense because there's just so much more, you know, lip service given to it. Um, and, and yet, you know, yet we have arguably, you know, even, even worse situation now with, with forced labor in China than we've had, you know, in Xinjiang than we've had in, you know, even in years past. Definitely. Maybe a more cynical approach you could take is, you know, if companies can find this to be a, um, profitable for them in a marketing way, uh, if we could make like sustainability 2.0 or come up with some kind of a new term for them to use as a marketing buzzword that forces them to, in order to use that marketing buzzword, they have to reveal all of their audits or they have to reveal a lot of more, a lot more information about how they're sourcing. Um, that could be something that could potentially force companies to be more transparent. And, um, but that starts with us as the consumers letting companies that we want this information. Right. One, one especially dark part of the, of, of all this that you do get into um, is, is the, the organ market um, and, and how that's all tied in to this as well. And it's, you know, incredibly harrowing. And um, what, what did you find on that score? Yeah, um, well, actually the China Tribunal in London in 2019, they are this um, independent panel of human rights lawyers and medical experts. And they looked at a lot of the evidence, especially the medical evidence and found that there's just no way that China is able to produce that many fresh organ matches for people, especially for the organ tourism industry. We have a lot of foreigners going in to get organ transplants. China just can't produce that many organs based on a natural death rate. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of evidence that political prisoners, prisoners of conscience and other prisoners are, are being killed for their organs. Um, and there's very little transparency there and, and in terms of how China gets those organs and what the real numbers are. But, but the organ transplant industry in China is a $1 billion a year industry. So um, it's an incredibly, incredibly lucrative uh, thing for them to do, unfortunately. Yeah. How, do we know, do, we, do you have a sense of how much of, of what, what you've written about here is, is known in China itself? Um, you know, you know what on, on all these different fronts, but um, whether it's um, what what the drug treatment centers really are, or or the oak or the oak or organs um, harvesting, or all the rest of it. I mean, is there are there any parts of it that are, that are actually somewhat more more known and that's kind of percolated out more than others? It's a great question. It's a, it's a complicated one. You know, I think there's definitely pockets of people and groups that do care and, and are aware, um, particularly various kinds of pro-democracy activists, women's rights activists, Hong Kong activists. Um, that a lot of them are more willing to defy the 
Chinese government's narrative and be open to um, finding more information about problems in China and, and trying to fix them. Uh, but for the most part, most people just have a lot of difficulty um, actually accessing information in the first place. You know, you need a virtual privacy network, a VPN, which um, is incredibly hard to get in China, get one that works um, and just just works all the time. Um, you usually have to like leave China, download it and then come back or something like that. It's, it's just not easy to get this technology to work to be able to overcome this, the, the firewall. Um, and even for people who are, who do have the kind of tech savvy ability to get uncensored information, they, a lot of them would be too patriotic um, and, and not really open to, to criticism of the Chinese government because, um, you know, it's a lot of times this kind of information is portrayed as um, fake news from the US government or from, um, from other countries that wanna make China look bad. And if, if you're really nationalistic about your country, you're just not open to that kind of view. Right. Um, so, so there's a lot of different reasons, but I would say for the most part, people actually in China who have never left China are, aren't really aware. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it happens that it's happening at such a scale and it's so, and it's so harrowing that you, you would hope that, it, that we're just kind of would get out even organically, you, you, you know, even if it's, if there's sort of below the censorship, censorship level, um, and the kind of um, the web censorship level, but, um, but 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 as we know, I guess that there's there's all sorts of horrible things that can happen in societies that are that societies decide to kind of to 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 somehow submerge or ignore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right now in China, e even if you were able to get a VPN, if they find out that you have a unregistered VPN. Um, that's not registered with the Chinese government, then you could go to prison. You could end up in a camp yourself for, for having that. So it's incredibly dangerous for people to even, even try to access the information, even if they wanted to. Right. The, um, one of the you know, few sort of truly uplifting moments in, in the story is, is when the, the mom from suburban Portland actually, after, after you know, Turning in this this note that she got and alerting people to it, um, follows things through, right? And and actually tries to tries to establish a connection, um, and, and and to the point of actually traveling halfway around the world to to meet, you know, to meet the author. And I I, I was kind of kind of struck by that 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 for this one consumer that there was actually actually. A real connection made and, and like deep in her conscience and and you know what, what happened there and why do you think for this one woman this one mom there, there was some kind of a nerve struck i think a nerve struck because she didn't just buy this product on amazon with one click and you know never found out anything about what how it was made you know mm -hmm. the person who made it contacted her and asked her to help and told her specifically that he was being tortured and, and, and not paid in, in, the, in the factory camp that he made this product at. And that I think was, that was, that information was just too, she couldn't forget that in half an hour, you know, is one right. of those things. And mm -hmm. I think the, we don't all have to receive a letter like that to, for us to, change the way that she did right. we just have to be open to the information i think right and she and she went all the way to to indonesia right yes um he actually later was able to leave china and live in yeah. indonesia for a period mm -hmm. and, and she went to go visit him when when yeah. he got out and that was um quite quite moving and i almost wanted to win end the book there but but unfortunately uh, the camps have haven't closed and they've only gotten worse unfortunately since since uh, since Soon's time in Masandia. Right. Um, I, I can't help but ask sort of a trade question or a craft question to, to wrap up, but how did you did you struggle with any structural issues with the book? Did, or is it pretty obvious to you how you were gonna um, go about uh, you know the basic organization 
here. That's something I had to deal with a lot in writing fulfillment. There were definitely definite structural challenges. Oh yes, I definitely had a lot of structural challenges. My editors can tell you all about that. <laughs> we went through a lot of drafts. Um, and my editors were great, uh, Betsy and Abby from Algonquin. They um, really put a lot of heart into helping me think about structure. I originally wanted to start um, in, in Masanja as the opening scene, but mm -hmm. my agent and editors all pointed out that it's important to show the show us as Americans. Right. receiving this product you know yeah. as we, we are not so different from julie keith this mother of two who right. you know was just decorating a party for her kids you know, and and it starts with us and it can end with us right the uh the one the item the other item that 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 he's making so often in the camps is are the paper mushrooms that that, that really struck with me that those are the these are these are the things you you'd use to decorate like a you know like just like string through parties are those what we're talking about yeah yeah they were like crafty decorations yeah. um, for a party or for children these were really really trivial yeah, yeah. i know it's there's such trivial things that that the, the the gap between their triviality and the extreme anguish and like like fatal pain with, with which they were made is just it's stunning really it's and it's you get that across so well so yeah, yeah. really read the, read this book thank you so much i i really appreciate hearing that from you i just started reading uh fulfillment um and it's i'm already hooked on the first few pages it's the the human stories um you i think you've already in the first few pages you did an incredible job on, humanizing the people um, who do end up working in Amazon and how that happens. It's, yeah. It could be one of us. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Amelia and Alec, for sharing your work with us tonight. Thank you for the hearing and speech agency for signing the Baltimore Museum of Industry for being a fantastic co-host and all of you for joining us. Please take a moment to fulfill the survey in the chat so that we can bring you more exciting, informative programming. Thank you so much. Right. Well, again, I want to say thank you so much to Alec for reading my book. Thank you so much to the Enoch Pratt Lab Library and the Baltimore Museum of Industries for, for hosting this event. Um, really encourage everyone to support Alec's books and, and, and to support all libraries and books at the moment. There's such a huge, um, a huge part of the community. Yeah, go back to the Pratt next week. Yes, yes, yes. Monday. Yes, all right.